The Rights to Ricky Sanchez podcast is presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Sign up for DraftKings Sportsbook, download it, and uh, download the app, and use promo code RTRS. It's brought to you by SeatGeek. Get $20 off your first SeatGeek order with promo code RTRS. LL Pavorsky Jewelers, where Rights to Ricky Sanchez listeners go and get engaged. Big Barker Therapeutic Dog Beds. Get yours at bigbarker.com slash Ricky. And Kinetic Skateboarding. Get 9.1% off your first order with promo code Dave Silver. On the show today, LeBron tweets, and we get a ton of emails suggesting that the tweet is about Ben Simmons. We're nine days away from training camp. Mike O'Connor ranks the Sixers that have the most pressure on them. Sixers Adam ranks the teams he is most scared of in the East. And we do our best to go on a massive mailbag and Twitter and Reddit question clean out as we, the off season is like almost over, believe it or not. Thankfully, not thankfully, I don't know. Without any further ado, Amos and the chef. Welcome to the Rice Ricky Sanchez podcast. I'm Spike Eskin, along with a guy who I'm sure is in no way prepared for Sixers training camp to start in nine days. That is Mike Levin. Are we ever prepared? No, I guess not. I guess not. This. I was thinking this morning, is this the worst offseason <laughs> we've had just in terms of everything? I, I think it is. There's been some obviously retrospective bad off seasons definitely, and, definitely retrospectively bad for sure right like you know the horford and okafer like a lot of retrospectively bad off seasons but i can't remember one feeling as bad as this one has felt i mean hinky resigning in the colangelo situation was was pretty tough but from a well hinky resigned during the season it was mid april it's basically the end of yeah the season. yeah but, but sure. like there was something right i mean there was still the lottery and still won the lottery that off season yeah, and still true. had the draft to look forward to. I'm just, I'm looking like totality, even that time it felt bad, but it felt like there were, it was like that there's the combination of a lack of movement and the end of the season and the, the Simmons thing, like all in one is just a, has for me at least has been the worst off season that we've experienced. Like I hate well, it. it. They've, it's just been a, it's been an incomplete off season. Yeah, because it's very clear what they, what everyone's trying to do, mm -hmm. and it's been on hold until it's possible to. Like I, I like, I like their draft. I like who they resigned. I like adding George Niang. Drummond is for Doc, but I like how the weight that Maxi's put on offseason Maxi videos. I'll gobble that right up. It's just a matter of the the big elephant in the room. Right. Speaking of which, there is a tweet and I'll read an email a tweet from LeBron James says, why do so many ball players work on the stuff they're never going to use in the game? Serious question annoys me a tad hmm face. And then we got this email from Jackson. I really don't want to continue to talk about Ben Simmons any more than needed, but do you guys think that LeBron tweet is a shot at Ben Simmons? We all know they have a good relationship and LeBron is throwing shade to one of the things Ben Simmons is best known for. Part of me thinks LeBron could just be trolling on Twitter, but who's to say I attached the tweet below in case you have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't think that there's any way it was about Ben Simmons. Oh, I mean, it, it, I think Ben Simmons could be part, part of it. Really? Like you okay. see, you see like, I mean, this is another LeBron guy, but like Tristan Thompson workout videos where he's like doing a ton of dribbling and it's like, you're not going to be dribbling. Who's letting you dribble? Right. Like there's, there's more, there's more people it could be, but I do also think that Ben is, uh, you know, 
notoriously one of those people. Yeah. That that is working on stuff that he doesn't show during the season. That's the whole thing. If he did that, then this would be a lot different. Well, we yeah, I'm just getting I'm starting to get like in the I so every job I've ever had, I get whether it's good or bad. Mm-hmm. Um whether the you know, even before I became a TV writer, like whether the show's good or bad or whether the boss is good or bad or whatever, I, I end up getting Stockholm syndrome. Just uh-huh. like after a while, I just get comfortable and just like start making excuses for whoever's bad behavior. I'm just like, okay, this is fine. Yeah. And so I'm now at this place where I'm like Stockholm syndrome of like, you know, the Sixers are are going out and saying, or not, they're not going out, but the reports are, okay, come to camp. We haven't gotten the deal that we want. He's still got several years left on his contract. Um, we'll just come into training camp and we expect him to be there and we expect him to to play. And Embiid, his quote from whatever, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, said, like, I don't want him to go. I want to play with him, all that stuff. And so I think at first for most, for several weeks, it was like, okay, well, that's posturing and, you guys are just playing the game and trying to get people to be interested and not make it seem like you a, a deal has to be made before the right one presents itself. But now as we get in nine days shy of training camp and as we're, we're really approaching this thing, um, I'm starting to, my brain is starting to get, get to a place of like, okay, well, what if, what if they don't trade them? And I think that that's probably going to happen is it's going to be a hardened thing where they trade him maybe like two weeks into the season or whatever. Um, but what if it's not? What if what if he's on the team all year? What if maybe he doesn't um, maybe if he doesn't report initially and then he does show up and then they start actually playing and stuff? And obviously your feelings are very well known. I don't think we have to do that. But I, I as an exercise, mm-hmm. um, I want to just present. What if <laughs> this is? I almost said, "What if everything works out?" Which is just like the most in, in like a in like a sketch version of something I would say. Uh, they would that would be what someone wrote for me. Um, but say say like Maxi does take a huge leap, right? Maxi becomes as good as like this season, as good as like Mike Conley was last season, or or in Mike Conley like close to his prime. And it's like, holy crap, like that's a hell of a leap. You say and you say that Maxi becomes as good as Mike Conley in his prime this year. Like he just takes a big leap. It's just okay. it's off the cuff comment. But like he becomes okay. like legitimately good and not like second year player good, like legitimately good, like probably should have been drafted like fourth overall good and is now really playing. Um and Tobias does actually start taking quicker threes. And Ben takes 63s on the season. Not an, a huge amount, but like enough to be like, he does it about once a game. And Doc does play non-traditional center minutes outside of Embiid, and they work to find, whether it's Ben or B-Ball Paul or Ben and Matisse or whatever it is, those things to allow a different element of play all the all our complaints all of our issues with these guys what if they are resolved and and ben and so maxi becomes the primary point guard ben still pushes in transition still runs the offense sometimes but is comfortable screening is comfortable picking and popping occasionally like and it just not like isaiah joe becomes clay thompson but like what what we feel are slightly reasonable requests for everyone to improve their game in these specific ways. Wouldn't that be still the most ideal scenario in a world where a, a Damian Lillard trade is not existing? Let me read you this email from Charlie. I was trying to find it as you're reading it. This is the second part of his email. He said, one of my favorite parts of the pod is Mike's insistence that he is, quote, not concerned. Whenever Spike asks Mike, (laughs) how concerned are you about this or that, or this or that potentially falling apart thing, 
Jane That's Springer's fair. Jane Springer's offense, for example, or a run Not of concerned. nights that Joel looks tired. Not Mike concerned. is almost never concerned. That's right. It's so comforting that it's almost suspicious, but I always <laughs> want to go along with it, even if it looks like a train wreck is coming. I'm yeah, not concerned. Sure. Almost feels like a Ricky version of keep calm and carry on at this point. Sure, sure, sure. So that he asked for a t-shirt. I so, think uh, I am concerned about what I just said not happening. It's not. I don't think it's like ideal. And I am concerned about like Ben just coming into camp or them expecting it. Like I'm, my concern level is, is right. I just is I thought it was up. good. Timing. But just because we've been doing this, Ben has to be traded this whole off season, and oh. everyone knows how we feel about it already. I just wanted to. We're for just, a hypothetical, like what if what if they just improve the one thing we keep asking all of these people to to do? I mean, Joel improved last year to become an MVP candidate, including his conditioning. And that was the thing that for several years people were like, he's never gonna do that. And he did. It, and so I just wondered, like, it's not these aren't crazy asks, is what right, I'm but, saying. But for Tobias and Ben, they're asks of things that they've never done. No, no, I know, I know, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, I know how you feel. I 100 yeah. percent know how you feel. Yeah, I just, don't, I just think, I, I think in the world where just like hypothetical, let's say I'm positing that this that this could happen, and it does, and it does happen. You're saying Wouldn't isn't that, that be still the best the best thing in a in a version that is not not a Dame trade? Because I look at, you know, just starting to look at the East and uh, Milwaukee's still obviously going to be good. Brooklyn's going to be good. Um, Ben's f positional flexibility to, on the defensive end is still would be enormous against those guys. And if we trade him for Malcolm Brogdon and TJ Warren, whatever, anybody, or the San Antonio package and a bunch of picks, whatever, that that's a big gaping hole. And in a world where I've been saying you can't just – phone in a year of Embiid's prime when he's this good and coming off a season that he was this good. It's they I think that and maybe that's what Daryl's thinking is that like we can't just accept a trade that's a a B minus. Yeah. Because I, because I, this is a, this is the year of Embiid's prime that we don't I still think have to that, treasure. I still think that the best even if, if that were all to happen, I think the best thing about that happening is that it would make Simmons more valuable. But like because I I just I still look at them and even in that scenario, I'm still like, well, oh, well, I forgot your scenario also has like Tyrese Maxey looking amazing. Then, yes, yeah. I would agree I mean, with you. Maxey being like not an all-star, but like close to an all-star. <sighs> like averaging, you know, 20 and like 19 and six or something like that. If you could pick one of those things, what would that one thing be? Because, because let's be honest, that all of those things happening is almost impossible. If you could pick one to of me, those to things. me, they're not. I mean, I know that they are because of because of looking at the looking at the like, rearview mirror, looking just looking behind us. But they're not like horrendous. Like I, but all of it's, them. It's just like asking is. someone to like, hey, just you know, cut out dairy. Like it's not like impossible to do. It's not impossible to do that. Tobias would be like, okay, I need to get off. Six or seven threes per game. I have to do it. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have to do it. I have to make make the determination to do it. People add things to their game all the time. I'm not saying like Tobias becomes like an elite ball handler passing savant. It's just like do the thing a little bit more than that that you have done, and do it consistently over the course of the season. Uh, because in the first half of the season, he was taking threes quicker, and then that I think he reverted back to the kind of guy he was. As the season went on, what 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 would it, I like the most? It's, I mean, it's probably Maxi becoming a, yeah. a a borderline yeah. all star player. Yeah, um, he looks very good. He was very good in summer league. I I love him. I love him coming into the draft. I think this is all. I think he's going to be eventually a an almost all star player. It this would be a quick, obviously a very quick place to, for that to get to. Um, and I also wonder, like, just lineup wise, like, how much is Doc going to play him over over Seth or Danny or whatever? Um, and it's hard to imagine, obviously, Ben deciding to shoot sixty whatever threes a game and or a game uh, a season, and and even just being there and, and then like working it out and it being fine. It's hard. It's hard to imagine those things for sure. But I just think I just look at the matchups of like if you take Ben out and put those guys in, like I. 
I just think that the, there's unless it's unless it's Dame, unless it's somehow Zach Levine, which it won't be, or Brad Beal, which it probably won't be. I just don't. I think really Brad Beal is going to get traded. I think Brad Beal is going to get traded by the deadline. I think he is. maybe. Yeah, yeah. that's entirely possible, is. and that yeah. that could be that could be like the two you know big faces on the whiteboard. Yeah. In, in Sixersville, where you're just like these are the guys we're going for. This is everything. So how can what even starting to think what would the Wizards want? What would the Blazers want if yep. in a in like a in a half step Ben trade? But I don't know. I was just thinking like it would be really really nice to have Ben and Danny and Matisse against Brooklyn. Well, you know, you did lead this off by saying that at work you get Stockholm syndrome. So you know, I, absolutely. But I'm also just start trying to think of like the the like we're the reality we're in is that he hasn't been traded yet and it's been a long time of this so what if this holds up starting to think like okay it's obviously not great it's obviously going it's unlikely that some fences can be mended especially like ben and doc like it's i'm not saying like this is happening it's great but like just starting to accept our position and go like if Ben's like okay, I gotta raise my value, and his camp's like just play one more season, and the Sixers are like okay, we gotta raise his value, and like people don't want to trade with Daryl or whatever whatever the reason is, you just go from there and go like well, what if everyone got did one worked on one thing in the off season that made them a lot better? Seat Geek is a sponsor. I feel like time. you didn't even answer it. I feel well, like well, what's my what's my answer? I think it's impossible. Well, yes, it would be great if our second year low first round pick point guard became as good as a hall of famer in his second year, he's I think hall of famer. Was, Mike Conley. I don't think he's a hall of famer. Well, he's borderline. He sure is. I mean, he yeah, absolutely. Is. I, I, I'm not saying a hall of famer. I'm saying a borderline also player like Julius, Rand the jump Julius Randall made like it's a lot for sure, but I think he's going to be good. I'm sorry. To Julius Randall made the jump in his like sixth season. Like, yeah, but he was bad for several years for a while. And Max, yes, was but, good but, but I, I, I don't think, I think, do you know how many of those things I think are going to happen? Zero. None of them. Tobias Harris won't be any different. I, I know. I know well, what but, you think. So but what I you, said in the hypothetical the version, I'm asking a, a prompt because we've done the same Ben conversation for as long as long right, as we've done. But so I'm, I'm just I, like, I'm well, saying, like, let's, what is, based on what's out there, based on other things, we start to think like possibility wise. It's, it's hard to, it's impossible to know like when the like pickup game and LA fitness, whatever, Three point shooting will ever translate. If it will, it probably won't. But I, I don't like, know what you're it, asking me though. Like that, that's my my question. I, I don't know how to answer. Like, what if those what the small chance the of question? those things happening? But is that a better chance of the Sixers competing for a legitimately an NBA Finals appearance? Better than whatever non Dame non Beal trade there is on available to us that, that's all i i guess but like i i don't it 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 involves tyrese maxi becoming the player that they're missing essentially and yeah, like not, i mean not not as good as dame but like him him becoming like as good as drew holiday no a, a little bit worse a little, a little bit worse than drew and obviously worse defensively being like a being like a 19 and 6 guy on like decent percentages yeah, I, I just, I, I don't think, I guess, but I, I, if Tobias Harris becomes a player that he's not, and Ben Simmons becomes a player that he's not, and Tyrese Maxey becomes a player that he's not, sure, yes, that's the the best case scenario. But like, I, I just, the odds, I, the odds of one of them happening are pretty slim. So the odds of three of them happening in the same season are like impossible. It would be nice. It would be great. Uh, it would be a, a great result, but I, I, I can't. How many times out of a hundred do you think that happens? I don't know. I have to talk to them. I would like to ask ask Tobias what, why not? Why isn't he doing that thing? And Ben would be like, "What if you just a little bit?" And Maxi, I'm just gonna be like, "I believe in it. I believe it 100 percent for Maxi." Do you see him at like Fan Fest or whatever it was called? He's a, he's a king. He's gonna be put him on a put him on a Sixers uh, or a Philadelphia sports tattoo. Uh, he's perfect. And I, I actually think maybe Doc playing a small ball five is the least likely of the of those things. 
Uh, as I mentioned, SeatGeek, a sponsor of the rights to Ricky Sanchez. Of course, you'll be able to use SeatGeek to get your basketball tickets once the season starts in five weeks. You can use SeatGeek to get everything. In fact, you want to use SeatGeek to get tickets to anything. I was just looking. So last summer, not this past summer, but the one before, I was supposed to see Rage Against the Machine at Firefly. They were playing all these reunion shows. They, of course, got canceled. They are playing at Madison Square Garden there show got postponed to August, 2022. I'm looking right now. See, you could look at all these other confusing ticketing sites, or you can just use, use SeatGeek, which takes all of those sites, puts them into one non-confusing platform. And I can see that I can get sex tickets in section 119, row two, that's on the side, lower level for $161 a ticket. And that is rated a 9.8. That's what SeatGeek does for you. It rates it a scale of one to 10. And a color coded as well. Like I see an orange, a moderate price, that's like a 3.8. But the amazing deal, the 9.8, is like a dark green. That's what SeatGeek does. It takes ticket buying, which for some stupid reason has become complicated and makes it really simple. And it's about you. They just want to help. That's why they have over five, 50,000 five star reviews. 50,000 five star reviews. You only need SeatGeek. It's the only ticket buying app that you need. I've used SeatGeek. You should use SeatGeek as well. To make it even better, for your first SeatGeek purchase, we're going to give you 20 bucks off your tickets. That's right. For your first SeatGeek purchase, use code RTRS. You can use the app. You can download it. Use the code that way. Or you can go to SeatGeek.com and use code RTRS. Um, again, $20 off your first order. SeatGeek, um, code RTRS. I hope this Rage Against the Machine show actually happens. And I'm glad I don't have to go to a festival to see them because I am too old for festival shows. Um, you were saying uh, you were talking about the rest of the East. Um, oh, actually, I wanted to read this. The, the second question from Jackson, who uh, who sent the, the LeBron question. He said he wants to know your thoughts on Halloween. Personally, I think the costumes <laughs> aspects are cool, but creative, uh, creative and otherwise. But the holiday itself is overrated. How would you rank Halloween, Mike? I don't know. Why I expected a basketball question. Well, he, the, um, the first one was about LeBron. Just to be presented, be like I'm on a basketball podcast. Here we go. We're talking about the Sixers. How do you feel about Halloween? It was just. It felt. I was just. It just caught me off guard. Is all. Mm -hmm. um, Halloween. I'm. I'm middle on Halloween. I don't mm -hmm. love it. Like, I like occasional parts of it, but not a not a massive Halloween guy. Uh, I'm not like I don't put a lot of effort yeah. into. A costume once in a while i have but it's it feels like people really go all out and i'm i'm just not there one one halloween i was a beer and my friends all got mad at me because i got a costume a that was just like a like a glass just like a beer glass with a beer in it and so i was just i was just a it was a full full body costume beer and everyone was upset I love Halloween for kids. I like, I do like, I'm in a neighborhood now and I was in a neighborhood then where there's a good bit of kids that come to the door and I do. And I, like, I'll, if there's any mid teens out there who show up at my door with a shitty costume, I'm making you say trick or treat. You're not getting any candy unless you say trick or treat. Little kids don't have to, but the teens do. My wife likes, loves Halloween and always gets me and rebel and her the same costume. So we were all giraffes last year. Um, I don't like Halloween parties. I just, I hate Halloween parties. I hate a bunch of grownups dressed up. So I think for kids, it's amazing for adults that hang on to it too long. It's a little bit, a little bit sad. Um, Sixers Adam wrote an article about which teams in the East he is most scared of from a Sixers perspective. Now it is hard to judge this given that we don't know who's going to be on the Sixers. But I was curious if your top four was the same as his top four. He has them ranked Nets one, um, Bucks two, Hawks three, and Heat four. Um, I don't think that the Hawks will be as good. I think that they're mm -hmm. a good team. I think that they have a chance of getting back to the second round and stuff. I think they're just last season was a confluence of events. They got really hot in the second half. Once Nate McMillan took over, mm -hmm. I think schedule strength was part of that, but they looked really good. They obviously beat the shit out of us in a, in a very embarrassing way. Um, I think Boston will probably be better than Atlanta. 
Um, Ooh, that's interesting. I think that's possible for sure. I'm curious to see how that all fits together. That um, the Schroeder concert, the Schroeder uh, contract is a, a good one. I'm curious to see how Udoka does as well. Mm-hmm. But my guess is that Horford will be fine for them. You know, we'll we'll provide what they need, especially with uh, who's the young guy they've got, Time Lord. Um, Robert Williams. Yeah, sort of, sort of uh, coming into his own. I think they could be better than the Heat as well. I'm mm-hmm. I'm curious to see how the Heat are. Um, yeah, I mean, the Heat are an interesting team because of because they have three like very impressive also passers and defenders um, on one team that and then Lowry fits really nicely in because they, I think they were struggling a little bit because neither Bam nor Jimmy really shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Lowry just like fits in nicely to that. Um, so I, I think they'll be pretty good, but they are kind of thin. You need a lot from hero to, uh, to bounce back from last year. Um, be, I think they'll be pretty good. Yeah, when when you look at his no, his numbers from last year aren't like terrible. When you watched him, he did not pass the sort of eye test he did his rookie year. There are a lot of players who do that. I mean, there's a reason mm-hmm. the sophomore slump is a sophomore slump. I still think he's he's good. I do think that the bull he has uh, five, six, seven, eight. He has Celtics, Wizards, Bulls, Pacers. I think what? the bull. Yeah, I know. I think. The Bulls are going to stink. I think the Wizards are going to stink. And I think, I don't know about the Pacers. Now, he didn't rank these in terms of who he thought would be better. With the Wizards, he said, the Wizards are much worse than this ranking would indicate. But we've all seen the story before. The Sixers head to Washington to play it, to play a game. They should win handily. They show up looking oh, okay. out of sorts. And multiple Wizards guards sure, towards sure, their sure. defense. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I think the Bulls will be pretty good. I think that they have enough offensive firepower to just run teams out of the gym Mm -hmm. um and in the regular season when some teams aren't trying i think that'll be enough to be like to maybe get to the like a five seed if things if things work you think so the bulls could probably lose in the first round but i i think that they i think i mean they levine's really good he's he definitely took a big step next year last year i think DeRozan's actually especially with DeRozan's like passing improvements over the last couple of seasons he's really good he gets the line a ton Vucevic is him and I guess like Towns is the best stretch fives in the league. So as far as like willingness to let it fly from out there, he's, he's automatic. Um, I really like Lonzo. I think Caruso is a very helpful player. Um, Pat Williams seems like he'll just be like solid uh, and not be required to do too much. I think, I think they'll be, I think they'll be totally fine. I don't know if Billy Donovan's a good coach or not still, but he's good enough probably. Yeah. There's just something that doesn't look right to me about them. That just maybe you're not a real team until you don't seem like a real team until you you are, you know. But like that's fair. The, a little, a little ju- bit like a two K team feels like. Yeah, I could, I could see that. Yeah, just like this confluence of 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 players who you're like, yeah, that player's pretty good. Yeah, that player's pretty good. But I can't imagine in my head how it actually works out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I agree with you on Levine. I, I love Levine, but I'm I'm just not buying them. Um, yeah, I think the rest of them, I, I think is about the same. Obviously the, the nets are number one, um, them with, you know, have done a good job in the off season and they will have all, all three guys playing the entire year. I would assume they'll obviously be the best. Yeah. Um, I, I could, I could see the Pacers being better than expected. Um, apparently if, if this, if this, if what happened last year in Indiana happened in other more major markets, I think it would have been a more huge story, but like. Apparently, everybody just hated Nate Bjorkren. And like he just yeah. did a terrible job. And like people yeah. were just miserable there. And so they were a good team the year before. But well, TJ Warren had not, surgery just to not play, right? Just to not play, right. Yeah. So I think like between Warren coming back and it, it depends on if they if they decide to make another trade. I don't, I don't know that the Sabonis, Miles Turner uh, union should continue. Um it would be nice if they packaged one of them and another guy to actually get a guy, but I think that's the hardest thing. They have a bunch of like pretty good players and and no one that is like a real person to build a contender around, um, including Brogdon and Levert and Warren and Sabonis and Turner. Um, but they have a number of good players, and I think just having a new coach in Carlisle would will make them better and they'll win regular season games. And they could also push for like a like a sneaky uh, 
your favorite Hawks team kind of four seed type of thing. And I also think he had the Raptors ranked 10th. I, I just don't think the Raptors are going to be bad again. I don't. I, I know that there's that there's a little tension there, obviously, between Siakam and uh, and Nick Nurse. And, you know, last year, like you just have to look at their track record. And last year, just, you know, I, I don't know. Like there are a lot of things that, that they weren't even playing in Toronto. And I just, I, mm-hmm. I if I had a bet, that the, the Raptors will be good again. Somehow, some way, the Raptors will be good again. That would be my Yeah, a, a really weird offseason for Toronto. I think you're totally right. They, they played in Tampa last year. That was just very bizarre on all counts. It was like a Kyle Lowry goodbye tour that like he's like saying goodbye to like empty ballrooms. It was just very weird. They didn't do much this offseason. I, I think Dragic is mostly done. Um Precious Achua is a fine rotation piece. Scotty Barnes is going to take time before he's really helpful to to winning at a high level. Van Vliet now as like the number one guy. I, hard to see that having like tremendous efficiency. Siakam had a down year. There are like rumors of them trying to trade Ananobi. Gary Trent didn't step up in a way that I think that they maybe wanted to when he, when they got and they brought him over. Like, it's just, I'm just not sure. It feels like they're a, like too quiet over there mm-hmm. in a very uh, Jurassic in, Park type of way. It's quiet, too quiet. That something's going to happen. That's something. something that's why I've been like sneaky, sneakily thinking of them as a Ben, Ben destination yeah. for a long time. Would you um, trade Ben for Siakam straight up? N- no, no, I don't think it does, does anything. I, I, I get, I get why at least it's a little bit more, like individual creation, but I don't think Siakam and Tobias and Embiid is, is like a perfect fit either. I would yeah. rather, rather than making that trade and then having to hold for like several months. I, I don't think that that's yeah. satisfying. I would, I would do it for like Van Vliet and, and Ananobi. That'd, yeah. be, that'd be fun for me. So would I. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I would agree with you that it is awfully quiet over there and it doesn't seem like, you know, they, they, if they don't have the best, head of basketball operations in the league, you certainly tied for the best or something. So it, it does seem mm-hmm. like something, something would happen. They've had such a, such a long run of being a good team, you know, uh, whether with the championship in the middle there and then the weird season last year, but I, yeah. I would just expect them to figure it out. That would be my guess. Right now. They're like definitely a play in team, like n- no higher, no lower at this point, uh, which is big- a weird place, which is a weird place to be in. For a team yeah. that won a championship so recently and and mm-hmm. clearly values that, and such a weird championship too, you know, to mm-hmm. have an MVP level player, maybe the best player in the league that year for one year, mm-hmm. for one year, so strange. Big Barker is a longtime sponsor of the Ricky. We love Big Barker. They are sponsoring this year's Bark in the Park Run Team. Uh, people joining as we speak, October twenty third, Providence Animal Center, Bark in the park, raising money for Providence Animal Center. Our goal is $15,000. We're at, I think, 7,300, right around there. So if you join the team, thanks to Big Barker and By Nature, and you raise at least 75 bucks, you will get one of our team shirts as well as the Providence Animal Center shirt. So thank you to Big Barker for paying for the shirts. Big Barker, the only real dog bed on the market. We've had a ton of process pups coming in lately. So if you sent yours in, I apologize. They're not on the website yet. Sean sent in Maggie May, an eight-year-old Basset Hound Labrador mix. Uh, who else? Shane sent in two pit mixes. Leah and who's the other pit mix? I'm looking now. Uh, uh, Leah and Lou. Leah and Lou are processed pups as well. Look, uh, when you look at these pictures and you see the dogs laying on the big barkers, you realize the difference between big barker and any other dog bed. It's a real bed and they are not. When you put your dog in one of those crappy beds, you see as they lay on the bed, they sink to the floor. They're basically on the floor, laying on the floor. A big barker, supportive, which keeps your dog healthier for longer. Your dog's just going to feel better. Dogs have plenty of joints just like we do. And if you don't lay on the right bed, then arthritis is going to take hold of your dog eventually. And honestly, even if your dog's young. Nobody wants to sleep on an uncomfortable bed. You got to get your dog a Big Barker. BigBarker.com slash Ricky. BigBarker.com.
Dot.com slash Ricky. That's where you go. You get your big Barker dog bed and two process pup patches. So you can be like Leah and Lou and Maggie May and send us a picture and get up on the website and then eventually on our Instagram and Twitter as well. A 10 year warranty. The foam doesn't flatten or they replace it for free. A one year at home trial. If you don't like it, if your dog doesn't like it, not only will they give you a full refund, they will pay for the shipping as well. And uh, handmade in here in the USA or made in the USA. It's not handmade. I don't think. It's just made in the USA. I don't think they make them by hand. Maybe they do. Big Barker dog beds. <laughs> All right. The other article we had that I wanted to touch on was from Mike O'Connor, our friend Mike O'Connor, the good O'Connor. And he wrote this assuming that Ben Simmons is not on the Sixers. He wrote, who has the most pressure on them of the Sixers players going into this year? And rather than thinking about the ranking, I just sort of wanted to talk about the pressure on those players coming into this year, like what what this year means to them. He had Embiid ranked number one. I I would agree in that anything, any year will probably have Embiid as the number one because the most depends on him and he has the most to lose. But I do think him following up last season with something at least equal um, in terms of the amount of games he plays and the quality of his play um, to really cement him as to where he was. Because I still think that there's a good portion of people who are sort of like, yeah, it was a great year, but let's see it again. I think that's sort of where where he sits. Um, and I'm optimistic about that, but that's I think there's, al- there's always going to be a good deal of pressure on Embiid. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's a little... Like last year it was... Because Simmons was out for the bubble playoffs and they folded so easily um, and the team was so poorly put together that and Embiid just wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. It became like Embiid has to prove that he can be this good over the course of a season into the playoffs. And last season he just did. He did prove that. Um, They were the number one seed in the East. He put up incredible numbers in the playoffs when he was on a torn meniscus. Um, he just was really, really good and he was excellent. And so I think it was a little bit of Embiid prove it last year and he did. And I think this year it's a little bit of like prove it to Embiid. He signed the contract. He's here forever. Mm-hmm. Like obviously contracts are very important, but like if it goes it doesn't. It wouldn't take it long for it to go bad for Embiid in a couple years or whatever to be like, this isn't the place. They're not doing enough for me. Yeah, contract um, or not. Right. So, yeah. um, I think I. I don't feel like there's too much pressure on Embiid aside from, uh, whatever the result of a, of a Simmons trade or non trade is for him to like make that work as best he can because I think he already did. He did prove it. But I think for him also to be to say like. For him to think like, all right, I'm one of the five or ten best players in the league. Never been outside the second round. Um, it's time yeah. for that to change. Number two, I don't want to talk long about this, but he has Andre Drummond in that if Drummond <laughs> doesn't prove value this year, he could be out of the league. And I, I think that's, that's possible. You know, like Dwight that's Howard right. was in the same situation. You go from thirty million dollars a year to minimum contract. It sort of shows the amount of. Uh, unfortunately, he has to prove it on the Sixers. So can't wait for that. Yeah, I mean, I go back and I I stock I stock home myself with Andre Drummond every once mm-hmm. in a while, being like he was he can gobble up rebounds and against the second unit if he just like bullies people in a sl- less dumb way than Dwight did last season. Drummond's longer and bigger and younger, um, so if you get if you can get, I, I really didn't mind much Dwight Howard during the season last year. The no, playoffs, he was fine. He had it good became moments. Became untenable, and it was a nightmare. But during the season, it wasn't that bad. Drummond's a better offensive player. He's better, theoretically, more spry at his age. And, he, and now he has something really to prove, whereas Dwight was coming off of a championship and, and I think was just like, I'm, you know, twilight of my career. I'm having fun out here. And so for him, having fun was just elbowing other players in the throat and uh, <laughs> just fouling on every single screen. Um so I I feel like I feel hope that Drummond could be not a total nightmare, and I think it's on Doc to make sure that they have another option in the playoffs, so that what happened last season and every season doesn't happen again. 
um, but not crazy optimistic. Well, the thing about Dwight is that Dwight re eventually realized what he was, you know, and, you know, I, I think there was a lot of reality had to be set in and say, all right, I'm a backup, you know, and that's, that's what I am. I'm curious what Drummond, I, th I think skill wise, Drummond is better than, than Dwight Howard, but I think I could make the argument that he's not as good a backup center as Dwight Howard given sort of like what he tries to do every time he touches the ball. So maybe, yeah, he, um, I mean, he has to, he has to go through that realization also, but yeah, the hope is because he signed here, he is doing that. And the hope is that since Embiid will miss games from time to time, hopefully not over a long stretch, but you're, you're back to backs from here and there, mm -hmm. then Drummond will get a chance to then be the starter and do, do, you know, whatever he does over a full course of a, of a game, but it'd be nice to, Maybe not. I mean, at his age, like Drummond is better than Dwight. He is. I, I hear your point about about like mindset um, and getting and being in the right frame. But like, I'm. I think it's a higher upside move that doesn't have as much risk because the risk was Dwight was genuinely terrible in the playoffs and and cost them games. Well, but remember, Andre Drummond like was on the Lakers last year and played a played himself into a smaller role than Dwight in the playoffs. Um, and he was gifted the starting role and then eventually blew it. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, number three is shake Milton. I, I, it is an shakes had an interesting trajectory in that, you know, he does have moments where he seems awesome and he has moments where he, he just can't seem to like think the game the right way. He just, doesn't seem to know what his place is. Now, maybe that's the team's problem, like, because they don't know what his place is. But yeah. I, I do think he, it's like, is, it is a put up or shut up year for him in that um, I think they, I like what he really is. And if he's really going to be that like microwave scorer off the bench, he's just got to be that. And they got to let him do it. And then that's it. So I, I think it's an interesting year for him. Yeah. I think that, he took a huge leap forward in the bubble and and became like you have to into the, when when Embiid and and Ben were out yeah prior to the bubble pre bubble into bubble yeah and then I think coming into the season Doc gets here and Doc's like hey I was on the other side of that thirty seven point outburst against the Clippers so like that's who you are that's who you're going to be I think he came into the season with that mindset and when guys sort of locked in on him a little bit more um, when he was not able to like get to his spots as easily um, with more of a focal point against him. He's not that fast. He's not that strong. Um, it takes him, he, he doesn't have like a high release point of his jumper. So it takes him a little bit to, of space to, to get that thing off. Um, he wasn't getting calls. He started complaining to the refs about calls uh, all season long, which was tough. I think it just last season was he was successful in bursts. He's still a really good shooter from the outside. And he just, it was kind of a wake up call of what he needs to do. And so hopefully this off season, he's put on weight. Hopefully he's, he's worked on his bursts and like about finding his spots that he can get to and like drawing fouls in a way that would be successful. I still think, I don't think of him as a microwave, microwave scorer. I don't think, I think you just have to be, you just have to be, um, faster a little bit in mm -hmm. that in that role um yeah, Lou but Williams i think of him isn't. as absolutely uh he i mean he, he was when he was younger i guess but now yeah. Lou Williams is just so much smarter than than any other he can just get to his spot so easily i think that's still an ideal uh version of him but i think shake is just going to be a, a very solid rotation player for a long time um because of his length because of his shooting because of his secondary ball handling I'm interested to see now that Maxi is firmly like the point guard of the future, at least as currently constructed. I wonder what Shake's coming into the season looking like. What if he? What he's thinking? What his mindset is? Where he wants to fit in? Um, I'm I'm very intrigued, but I, I don't disagree that that there's pressure on Shake for sure um, because he's good and he should he should find his role on this team or somewhere else. There was also this other thing where his shot looked weird, like the last part of the season 
there was something that looked janky about it. And there were some games where it wouldn't, but there's some somewhere it would. And I just wonder what happened there. Like it was just to my eye, something looked wrong with this shot. Do you remember that? Do you remember it looking like it had a little like weird hitch in it or something, or he was pushing it? There was there's something strange about his shot the last part of the year. We we talked about it him shooting it looks like he's shooting a bowling ball and then it's yes. just very heavy um yeah. but i don't remember a hitch so much as it is like that's just kind of how his release looks hmm. um before we get to the last two on the list uh rights ricky sanchez brought to you by kinetic skateboarding who obviously sponsors au they're doing their they always have these raffles for these exclusive shoes they're doing the nike SB quarter snacks, which have like zebra stripes on them. Mm. So go to their, uh, if you want the info, just go to their Instagram, kinetic skateboarding on Instagram, 9.1% off your first order with promo code Dave silver. And also brought to you by LL Pavorsky jewelers, the original sponsor of the Ricky and the seller of an engagement ring to one Mike Levin, who can tell you all about the LL Pavorsky experience. Oh, still good. More he's paying for more <laughs> ad time from that. He's milking it. LL. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, come on. I mean it was it was a great experience, right? Great experience. And if you're if you if you live out of town, like I do, uh-huh. he's nobody has the handle on the mail like LL did. You got oh, there it you go. immediately. Yep. Never seen anything like it. Yeah. Um, added bonus. And they recommended some ring insurance. That yes. was important and something that I didn't know about. So I I asked John Gonzalez if I needed ring insurance. He was like, nah, you're probably fine. And I was like, that doesn't seem right. No, and he's so wrong. I called LL and he, he walked me through it. And it was like, yeah, I'm going to listen to LL and not John. Um, Jewelers Mutual? Is that what you used? Uh, maybe. Could be it. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a delight. And so, so what we've learned from this ad is go to LL for your jewelry. Do not go to John Gonzalez for insurance advice. Mm-hmm. Here, I just spent a lot of money on this one object. <laughs> Should I get it insured? Nah, you'll okay. be fine. Yeah, great. Uh, LL has been in business over 30 years at the same spot, 707 Walnut. He's there to help you. He's the original Ricky sponsor. If you would like to meet with LL about an engagement ring, make an appointment. It's always better if you make an appointment. 215-627-2252. Lee at LLPavorsky.com. Or uh, you can just tweet at him at LL Pavorsky. Always supports our charities. Coded by kids and the Providence Animal Center. LL Pavorsky Jewelers. Better jeweler than John Gonzalez. Officially. And four, four and five. So he has Maxi fourth. He says... I put Maxi this high simply because the expectations for him are so high. Many expect him to be the starting point guard and presumably build off a strong uh, end of the season. He has to prove whether or not he's the real deal if the fans' expe- expectations are are far too high. Now, Mike had him as a Mike Conley level player this year. I think if That's right. if the Ben trade does not happen early and if Ben is not there, I would agree that there is a tremendous amount of pressure on Tyrese Maxey, especially for a guy picked where he was picked um, in his second season for a team that expectations are this high. Do you Would you expect him to start if Ben's not there and there's no trade? Oh, absolutely. Even if Ben is there, I think he should start. I over, need, okay. Over whether it's probably Seth, maybe Danny. Mm-hmm. Just like you need, you need perimeter penetration. Need ball handling, need someone who can put pressure on the rim. And too often it's when it's not like dump the ball into Embiid and then like stand around and hope they don't double too hard. It's just like late, late in the shot clock stuff. Ugh, I'm so tired of that stuff. Like move, like let's go. And that's why Ben is valuable in the sense that like because he can make things semi transition into quick opportunities, this team's just never been a good half court offense um when things settle down they're just like not good enough especially as as they got fewer shooters and then fewer penetrators and so it became like it became like you got to get points in in the transition if you can um so yeah i look maxi was what last year the 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 league's 29th best point guard something like that maybe i don't know i'm asking him to get to like 16th 14th okay. or 16th 
I don't think it's that much of a jump. I know he's, I believe it's going to happen. I think he's capable of going higher, getting higher than that, getting like 12th. But let's say, let's say 17th is, is like a safe bet. That's a big jump. He's good. Mm -hmm. He has improved the jumper over the course of the year. He improved defense over the course of the year. He's gotten stronger. He figured it out. Guys love playing with him. Interested to see him as more of a distributor um, and get into the line more. I just, just, he's just, in, in a, on a team that unfortunately had a very upsetting end to the season. The season prior to that was a delight, but now we're just coming off this like bad feeling. Maxi is the like the best feeling on the team of anybody. And I'm just happy to ride, ride with him. Um, before we, I don't even want to, Tobias Harris, number five. I don't want to fucking talk about Tobias Harris anymore. We have two listener submitted jigsaws and then a couple of emails. Listener submitted jigsaw. I, he put a lot of thought into this one and, uh, I would like to know what you thought of this one. And then we have a, a second one that there was a little less thought put in, but I thought it was good as well. This one comes from Nick option. Number one, you have to pick a straw out of a hat to determine your marriage. There's a 50% chance you will draw an 18 to 22 year old TikTok star. You have to divorce or break up with your current significant other with no warning and immediately get engaged to the TikTok star. You will be on social media, magazine covers. You have to tell all of your family that you found a quote, serious connection and the media attention is quote, misconstrued and the TikTok star is quote, misunderstood. The other 50% chance is that you draw the person of your dreams, whether this is your current significant other, celebrity crush, whatever the case may be. You cannot cheat on the person you get. You cannot get divorced. You have to live with them full time. No loopholes. That's option number one. Option number two, every single day, you have to send a DM to a person of the opposite sex that you went to high school with during your four years. They can be four years younger or four years older, as long as they were enrolled at the same time and at least passively knew each of each other's existence. Your message must tell them that you have a great investment opportunity. Oh. If they if they open, uh, if they open and don't respond, you have to follow up with, did you get my last message? Let me know. You have to DM a different person every day until all possible people run out completely. And then you have to cycle back from the beginning of the list. This will oh. last until you raise $50,000. Uh, I'm gonna go with the second one. I'm not <laughs> interested in, in the with Mary, the TikTok, TikTok star. Very happy in my relationship. Yeah. Um, I'm not friends with a. I mean, I, I'm friends with a decent amount of people I went to high school with. Um, and I think some of them would probably give me some money if I had a good investment opportunity. I have to like come up with a pitch, but I I believe myself that I could like come up with some bullshit. That people would uh, would get behind. Um, I wouldn't like myself as I did it, but I uh, would rather keep being engaged to Alyssa. So let's let's go with that one. And the second jigsaw, option one for the rest of your life, you have to say whether you're peeing or pooping every time that you have to say that you say that you go to the bathroom. I do. Oh, really? Done. Oh, okay. Easy. I need people to know how long I'm going to take or that I'm not going to fuck up their bathroom or that don't worry, it's just going to be a quick one, whatever, any of that. It's, it's, called, it's called being up front. <laughs> the second option was you have to refer to yourself in the third person until 2 p.m. every day. Um, to the mailbag, this comes from on Twitter, Matisse Burner. When you guys pee at a public restroom slash urinal, do you A, just take your penis out and go pee? Or B, take your penis and testicles out and go pee. Option A is probably more socially acceptable, while B provides more comfort. Just curious. Go Sixers. So many P questions. Our yeah. listeners just like have been sitting on P questions their whole lives. And yep. like, finally, they, I found a place where I can ask them without. Well, they, they want to know shamed. if what, what they do is normal. Like right. you, you learn to go to the bathroom when you're little and then you never see it again. You only yeah. know what you don't you get. Do. You don't, you don't get like any weird. No one like gives you notes when you're like 12. <laughs> no, like, hey, no. Right. So, Hey buddy on this thing, this is um, how the lightning thing happens. It depends on the pant material. Okay. Um, if it's a, at a urinal we're talking about. So I think generally 
I don't like, I, I get concerned about, especially if there's a zipper situation, I get very concerned about any zipper pinching. That's alarming. Um, and I also don't want it to feel like if it's like a, a strong waistband, then it would all of a sudden, it could like snap against the penis and mm -hmm. then cause it to go awry. Uh -huh. And so I think off the top of my head, more often than not, I give myself as much space as possible. And so I take everything out. I don't. I think I have to just go like look tomorrow and see what I do. I, I just, like I can't think of it. I think it could be both. Live stream from the urinal with Spike. sure. Yeah, no problem, no problem. And uh, final, final mailbag question. Oh, I didn't write the uh, write the name. Um, non basketball. Were either of you ever into M MTV? Did you have a favorite show? It's crazy how it's become so irrelevant. MTV was a large part of my of my youth. So the answer to that is yes. Very predictable. Yeah, I watched a ton of TRL when I was in elementary school, middle school. So for sure. at when I was a teenager, even younger, MTV was a place that you found out about like new music. Like I mean, they broke Nirvana in a, a big way. So I MTV from a music standpoint, and then Headbangers Ball and 120 Minutes was. But then the real world, the beginning of it, like the first four or five seasons or whatever, San Francisco, LA, I'm trying to remember all of them, but I watched a lot of real world too. So, um, yeah, MTV was a, a huge part of my TV watching childhood. Um, uh, all right. Well, we are nine days away from training camp and we're still not going to have anything to talk about until there's a, maybe there's a preseason game or fucking Ben Simmons gets traded something. Maybe Tyrese Maxey will become Mike Conley. You never know. You never know. Let's keep let's keep things positive. Let's keep things positive. You never know what could happen. Um, otherwise, we will talk to you later this week. Do you have any anything you want anybody to watch? Uh, we're watching Doogie Kamei Aloha on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. We're catching up on Young Rock okay. season one on various things. If you um, don't fuck with me, we're having a great time, you guys. What, is, what an off season it, it has been. If you don't we'll talk to you now. during the week, are you down with TTP? Then I won't yeah, fuck with you. you know, like this. If you don't fuck with me, then I, then won't, I won't fuck, fuck with you. you. If you don't fuck with me, then I won't, I won't fuck, fuck, with fuck with you. But if you fuck with me, I'm gonna fucking kill you! Time for playing